Hello, good morning. Um, so I had, I've had a couple of experiences <laughs> since uh, I was here last, yesterday morning. Uh, one is that I got to do a Zoom call with one of my meditation teachers and a whole bunch of us. And one, uh, of course, many questions about how to work with the fear and the uncertainty and the mystery and the intensity of all the information and upsetting information. And there was many things that were offered. Um, and I might share them over the course of the next week. But one of the things that he offered, the meditation teacher, uh, Joseph Goldstein is his name. Maybe you've heard of him. He said that what's been helping him is meditating on the body. So one of the aspects of the first of the four foundations of mindfulness, meditating on the body. Um, and every aspect of it, every movement, every breath, and the mantra that he offered was this step, this step, and not necessarily stepping or walking in meditation, but this gesture of my hand, this word that's coming out of my mouth, this breath, this heartbeat. So the subtleties of experiencing your aliveness. Um, and I want to feed that into the practice this morning, working with the feet and the hips, because there was a, a question and a request about the feet. Um, and I also have come to uh, see, I see a lot of what I believe is people using asana practice for an escape. Fine, fine. <laughs> you, then this class will drive you crazy. My teaching will probably drive you, drive you crazy. If you just want to get on the mat and work it out, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm going to say there's a little bit of escapism in that and a little bit of avoidance behavior in that. And you may very well know that and be okay with it. Fine. Um, but the way that I like to do asana for me is meditating on the body. Uh, to quote Mr. Iyengar, maybe loosely, he said something like, you know, my body is the temple and my asana are my prayers. And uh, so we'll pray together in this way. I have my mat a little bit closer to start because uh, the question about the feet was in reference to something I mentioned the other day, the big toe toying. I got paint on my feet, sorry, I've been painting. Um, and I call it the big toe twang, and it's when we do a major amount of um, extension in the big toe and a little bit of flexion in the other toes. So the big toe twang sort of looks like this, where the big toe's all hiked back. And I see it a lot in mountain pose, this cue, well-meaning cue of lifting the toes. Uh, yeah, sometimes, but not all the time. And I see it most often in a supine extended leg stretch, Supta Parangustasana 1, where the down leg has got that big toe twang. So I mentioned in my somatics class last week, the horizontal nature of the toes and the vertical nature of the heel, that is sort of our blueprint. But the foot is a complex part of our body and it has a lot of options. Uh, I don't know how many joints are in the foot, I should know, it's 26 bones. So there's a lot of joints. And as I said before, the capacity to make changes in the feet. So one of the first drawbacks of the big toe twang is if that's all you got to activate your feet, you're missing out on heaps of potential change, not only in the feet, but in your body. Secondly, um, any time we're caught in one movement option, uh, again, not embodying our full capacity for for movement and um, thus health, we could say. Thirdly, the tips of the toes, the very toe tips, they're like little baby arrowheads. You know, I'm from the plains, so easy to find still today, a fair amount of arrowheads out in the fields. And um, the little tip is like each toe tip. And each of those five toe tips is where both the front and the back and the sides of the body all come together. So it's like a little vortex. And so to be able to point the toes 
in any direction. So if you start with me now and stretch your legs out in front of you, you can kick back on your hands. I think you have a good, decent-ish view of my feet. Maybe I'll bring them back a little bit. Maybe I'll put them up on something. Better. Uh, so you can just have your feet on the floor. This is so you can see. But if we flex the toes, which means curl your toes towards me, <laughs> and then add the ankle, right? So then this is an invitation for the whole front of the foot, tops of toes, tops of foot, up to the front of the leg to lengthen and to shorten through the back. Now, any of these movements I invite you to do today might give you cramps in your feet. And if you're well hydrated and you're not taking medications that cause muscle cramps, cramps are an indication of your body being exposed to new pathways uncharted territory, uh, new possibilities. So uh, pointing the toes and plantar flexing the feet. And then from there, can you sort of sweep the toes a little to the left? So the uh, right foot is doing a little um, rotating medially, left foot's rotating laterally. And then can you point the toes to the right? So as if the toe tips are little pointers, like they are little arrowheads. Try to do it from the toes. It's going to feed up into the foot bones and into the ankle bones. And then if you extend the toes and then plantar flex the feet, can you similarly, similarly like sweep the toes to the left? The feet will follow. And then toes to the right. Now, the big toe twang, if it shows up here, can you soften how much you're doing with your big toe? Maybe press your big toe a little towards me, towards the camera, or away from you, and pull the pinky toes back further. And then revisit the first one again. So toes uh, flexed and then uh, dorsiflexion of the feet and uh, swing toes right and left. So the thing about the toe tips being the gathering point, the meeting point for front of body, back of body, and sides of body means that in conjunction with habitual toe twang, you're constantly winding up this line from the big toe tip to your outer hip, which will contribute probably in time to more of an external rotation of the leg that can wear on the hips and knees for sure. It might, doesn't necessarily have to. Um, and then sec and another point about winding up that pattern with the big toe twang is the big toe twang itself sort of is the beginning of what is called hammer toes, where the joint between the toe and the foot, or the most proximal phalange, um, yeah, the, the phalangeometatarsal joint here, continues to shorten, 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 shorten. And then the undersides of the toes will um, can end up in this way. This is what they call the hammer toe, where you're short, where the toe meets the foot in the front, and you're short in the back of the toe joints. The uh, ideal scenario to combat that is can you uh, flex at the joint where the phalanges meet the foot, so the phalangeal metatarsal joint, and actually extend the toes. So it's like if you were to do this with your hand, not this, not this, but this. So not this, not this, but that. And this is just like uh, about four or five things that might just <laughs> blow your mind or blow your feet right off your body, not literally, um, but give you foot cramps like crazy. And we're just going to keep playing in this realm. So the person who reached out about the big toe twang, if I didn't quite cover what you were wanting to know, uh, reach out again. So we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to stay close so you can see my feet, and then I'll back up eventually. Please uh, have two blocks, a blanket, and a belt. Let's set the blanket up on one half of your mat where the fringe of the blanket is uh, at the end of the mat. <clears throat> We're going to put the belt right on our legs to start. So um, for some people, feet touch before knees. 
I'm one of those people. For some people, knees touch before feet. Whatever the case, wherever you land in that spectrum, have your legs simply, no, we're not there yet, but wherever you land in that spectrum, for people whose feet touch first, your belt's gonna go here on the mid calf. That's me. For people whose knees touch first, I think if you put the belt closer to your ankles, it's gonna be better. So for people who have a slight bow leg, oh so slight, not even really a bow leg, but just a little bit wider shins, put the belt at that widest point and have it so your feet are about hip width. For people whose knees touch before their feet, put the belt closer to the ankle, not right at the ankle, but lower, lower than mid shin. Again, so feet are hip width. So I'm gonna bring my belt back up where it's appropriate for me. And then simply come to lay on your back. <clears throat> Have your feet on the floor with a bigger than 90 degree bend. I'm gonna make it so you can see my feet a little bit better. A um, Little bit greater than 90 degree bend in the knees. So your feet are not real close to you. And from here, without the big toe twang, and maybe I'll just come closer yet so you can see. Can you get on the outer feet and curl the toe tips towards each other? So this is like a supinated foot with a little bit of plantar flexion. The feet are a little bit pointed just by where the feet are on the floor. And with the belt as a resistance, you're probably gonna get some feedback up the legs and then return toes flat to the floor. Keep a little pressure on the belt with your legs. Don't let the belt go slack. And then can you ride the inner edge of the foot, keeping the big toes down? So this is a pronated foot. Keep the legs pressing gently against the belt. Keep trying to peel pinky toe up. Big toe stays down, pronating. And then both feet supinating. So drop outer feet to the floor. As you lift the big toe, can you curl it under, right? So the habitual big toe twang, I'm showing it here, and I don't know why I'm showing it, but just for clarity, I guess. If that big toe wants to keep staying rogue and winging up and out, call it in, curl it under, endure the foot cramp if you can, right? This might be making your feet go haywire. It's a sign, right? So something else, we're just gonna stay here in the supinated foot, pressing a little bit against the belt, Notice the feedback all the way up the leg. Um, another point to all of this, the big toe twang, as I mentioned before, puts us in the surface of the outer leg. And to avoid the big toe twang and do more of this kind of work, let's go back to pronation, big toe stays down, pinky side of the foot lifts. Um, it's gonna build more deep strength into the what people call the core, or the deep front line, to use Thomas Hanna's language, or the Madhya Sutra, to use um, Baxter Bell's language. And then straighten your legs, straighten your legs. So now soles of feet are shining away from you. Point the toes to the ceiling, and maybe grab your head and look at your toes, so you could curl your head up and see if your big toes are closer to your face than your pinky toes, level that out. Find the toes sort of in a row. So they might have to add a little bit of pronation, right? And then can you, without the heels sliding, curl the toe tips towards the backs of your heels? So that's toe flexion. And then not letting the heels slide. So there's a way, if you watch the camera, I could plant our flex and the heels slide. Let's resist the sliding of the heels, right? So get the toe flexion and then try to curl your toes closer to the floor, closer to the backs of the heels. So now we're going into foot flexion, toe flexion, foot flexion, before we add, now the heels can slide, plantar flexion. There comes a point where my toes actually start to uncurl a little bit. My toes actually start to uncurl a little bit. And so I stop there, I stop there, and I try to get the toes to curl more as I plantar flex. 
my right toe's coming undone. So I just sit up and help it, actually. I'm gonna put my toe, my fingertips on my toe tips and invite the full curling of, mm, full flexing of my foot. From there, can you lead with your toe tips, extend the toes, then punch through the heel, they'll slide. And then uh, you're in full plantar, no dorsiflexion. Supinate, so keep the legs pressing wide against the belt and try to shine or wrap the soles of the feet towards each other, curling the toe tips towards each other. And then like you're scooping a big swoopy C shape or like horn shapes as you uh, keep the feet, mm -mm, keep the legs pressing against the belt. Maybe big toe tips touch each other as you then go towards a plantar flexion and begin to pronate, lifting pinky toenails towards ceiling, and then let that pull you into a dorsiflexion with pronation. So big toes are the furthest from you, pinky toenails are the closest to you, and your ankles are in dorsiflexion. And then swing the outer feet towards each other. So now we're going into supination in dorsiflexion. And then curl those toe tips into each other, begin to move towards plantar flexion neutral and from plantar flexion neutral into pronation with plantar flexion and then go towards so we're making big circles with the toe tips they swing in towards each other then reach long and swing out and then back towards you let's go the other way so passing through dorsiflexion with pronation into plantar flexion with pronation into pure plantar flexion. Plantar flexion with supination, curling toes towards each other, keeping the belt taut, and then pull all 10 toes curling towards each other back towards you into dorsiflexion with supination. And then dorsiflexion where you level out the toes, take a peek, make sure the big toe isn't the twangiest, and then go towards pronation, and then plantar flexion with pronation. And my ankles and my lower shin muscles are like a blaze, a blaze. Very hot, very warm and juicy. So relax, relax. Maybe do a little uh, point flex. And while we're here with this point flex, now I teach this a lot and over the years I've refined it. So there's a way in which I can point and flex from the front of the ankle, which I'm totally doing, which I guarantee most of you are doing right now. Can you pause that and add that little toe curl, so little toe flexion, and then use that as sort of like a tap, like you're pointing, tapping, tap, 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 the little toe curls away from you and find your way into the same heel rock that now perhaps is not generated from the front of the ankles, but perhaps now is generated from the deep sole of the foot. So maybe go back to the front of the ankle, point flex, point flex, point flex, easy and common, and we do it whenever we drive a car and step on and off the gas and brake. But with the little foot flexion and the little toe tap, can you guide the impetus for the heel rock deep into the arch of the foot? And if the answer is yes, then good job. And if the answer is no, then keep trying. I'm feeling the work all the way up in my hips. I'm gonna pause here and just let my legs be held by the belt, held not in, uh, they're held in neutral rotation rather than external, which is where my legs wanna go. So the next thing that we're going to do, I'm going to get back on my blanket. Um, before I do that, grab your block. And now I would like, same deal, block is still in the same place for people with a little bit wider shins. Can you keep the belt there and put the block between your ankle bones on its second side? in a way that, so my feet are totally free. And uh, there's tension between the block at my ankles and between my legs at the belt. Now for people who have that more of an X shape in the legs, the knees touch before the feet do, your guys' belt is down here, right? 
So please put the block on its narrow side between your knees in a way that creates a little bit of tension but it's not shoving your knees out, right? So generally speaking, people with the knees that touch before the feet, often there's a need to lift and gather in the inner leg. For people like me, whose tightest or widest part of the leg is like the outer calf, um, I need to get a little bit more length and drop in the outer leg. Follow? If not, you can rewind and go back and watch it later. So, uh, or message me and we can chat about it. So with your legs straight, get the tension. Don't do it with knees bent, because that's a different deal. So with legs straight, get the setup. And I'm coming back onto my um, mat. So hopefully you can still see my feet. Get your setup. <laughs> um, just tweaking here a little bit. Now, same deal, but the block is gonna provide a little bit extra biofeedback. So full dorsiflexion, that's all 10 toes back towards you at equal speed and intensity, not the big toe leading the charge always. And then keep heels stuck, begin to flex the toes, keep the heels stuck, move towards plantar flexion, and once you've shortened the soles of the feet, the foot flexing as much as you can, then let the heels slide so you're in full plantar flexion. Keep that, and then can you swing your 10 toes towards each other? Keep the 10 toes swinging towards each other and go into dorsiflexion so now you really feel maybe the inner edges of the top of the feet against the block. So we're doing the same toe circles that we did but now we've got the block resisting extra movement at the ankles if you have wider lower legs, or the block is resisting extra movement at the knees. My belt's slipping a little bit on my tighter calf. So go through all those ranges. We've got pointing and flexing, or what I call plantar and dorsiflexion. You've got inversion and eversion where the soles of the feet swing in towards each other, inversion and out away from each other, and eversion. And then you've got rotation where you try to swing the toes right and left, right and left without too much movement in the legs. And then supination and plantar flexion are all of those combined. It's a three dimensional thing. So supinating and dorsiflexion is like internal rotation, inversion and the, the dorsiflexion, right? You can keep that and go to plantar flexion. The legs will turn out a little bit, outer bum gets tight a little bit as you try to wrap the pinky toe sides of the feet towards each other with the ankles long. And then if you keep the ankles long and you go to pronation, trying to bring the big toes towards the floor, pinky toe nails towards the ceiling, and then keep that and add a dorsiflexion Right, so moving in these three-dimensional ways with the block and belt adding a whole lot more juice seen this factor. Oh, I'm pausing. I'm getting hot just doing it and like body temperature going up. <clears throat> From here, um, bring yourself up. Keep the block nearby. Take the belt off, make the loop quite a bit bigger. We're gonna land with one leg up, so uh, you might watch this. It's a very specific technique for the block and belt. So you want a full loop in your belt. Um, how long my loop is, here's what's gonna happen. I vote that you make your loop at least as long as your leg, at least as long as your leg, right? And then have the buckle near one of your hands. Don't have it in the middle. Buckle near one of your hands. And then have the block on its tall side and you're gonna step your foot on it and loop both of the belt straps around the block. Now adjust while you're sitting upright because once you lay down, it's hard to adjust. So ideally the two handles of the belt are equal length. And look at how I've got the strap around the block uh, sort of 
one part towards my toes, one part towards my heel. Keep a hold, lay back. Start with, and I got my right leg up. Start with left foot on the floor. It just makes it easier. And then do your best to straighten as best as you can find the right leg. And then pull in with the index fingers a little bit on the belt that's more forward and dig that heel up without twanging your big toe off the belt. Maybe inchworm your left foot a little further from you. Keep the left foot, that's the down leg, that big toe side heavy here. How far can you straighten the leg without the big toe coming off the floor? So I'm gonna pause there. Eric Shipman calls that the two thirds position. Back to the upper leg, full dorsiflexion. Now you can pull a little bit with the left hand to keep the toes glued to the block. Supinate with dorsiflexion. Pull with the right hand, pronate with dorsiflexion. Now point the toes, you can pull a little bit with the pinky side, pause here. Maybe left leg goes straighter, but lead with the big toe. I think the dog just moved the chair. Oh dear, I think we're good. So left foot, big toe is like furthest from you and maybe closest to the floor. <laughs> Keep that leg on fire. Right foot, I've got a plantar flexion. Now I'm going into soup, swinging the big toe side towards me. And then to pro, I'm swinging the pinky toe side towards me. Go back to dorsiflexion, right foot. Now I'm moving around. I've been doing this a while in my life, so I don't have any crazy hot spots or crazy intense places. If you do, man, stop there, breathe there, be there, feel it change, invite it to shift, invite it to soften or liquefy. I even use my, right now I've got both halves of the loop in my left hand, and I can use my own right hand to do what the belt was doing before. Create a little bit of different tug on the flesh, feeling into those lines of compromise, like where am I too taut? Where am I uh, not able to feel connection? I'm adding a little bend and straightening. So before we leave this side, bring your brain back to your left foot. In theory, it's still in plantar flexion and little internal rotation. Can you punch through the left heel? and invite your left foot to simply be in neutral, to not use the big toe to pull, to, to do whatever people do with that big toe. <clears throat> now to put the left foot in the block simply, and maybe it's simple. When I teach this in class, often there's blocks flying everywhere. I have no idea what's going on and you're free to completely I don't know, come undone here because no one can see you. So I'm using both my hands and my right foot to help organize the left foot on the block. Right foot to the floor, pause. Dorsiflex, left foot, straight up. So then you've got this great visual of your ankle. Now, those of us who have the block at our ankles not too long ago, can you uh, add a, an imaginary block? on that inner ankle. Same with those of you who had the blocks at your knee. When you go to dorsiflexion and the back of the leg is lengthening, if the, all the pathways of the muscles, of all the streams, all the nadis that flow from sit bone to toes aren't equally balanced, then you might in fact collapse at the ankle. You might in, flat, in fact twist a little bit at the knee. So if we add those imaginary blocks where they were before and go between dorsi and plantar flexion without swiveling at the ankle and knee, notice what you gotta do to work that out. Meanwhile, inchworm right foot further from you and make the big toe side heavier and make the big toe longer. That's your down leg. Pause in the two thirds position. Left foot now, dorsiflex with supinate. So big toe side coming towards you. 
You can pull with your right hand a little, or you can pull with your left hand to resist, right? Right hand encourages, left hand resists. Oh my God, there's en endless layers. We go towards pronation. Again, which side you pull with of the hands either assists or resists. What do you need? What do you need? And uh, return to dorsiflexion, straighten the right leg fully, right big toe leads the way, right big toe trying to touch the opposite wall and maybe where the opposite wall and floor meet. Stretch it long, I'm getting a cramp in my right foot, no big deal, it's just an inconvenient, uncomfortable sensation, like we haven't dealt with that in the last three weeks. Keep left foot exploring, simply connecting Simply connecting. It's a profound, simple practice to be with. Be with. And then let's neutralize right foot. So all the toes of the right foot are skyward. Right leg heavy as can be. And then you know when I found something because I stopped talking for a second. <laughs> All right. Casually, carefully take the block and belt away. Stretch your two legs long. Pause. And feel into the feet. My feet are warm and a little bit tingly. From here, grab your block and put your two feet up in the air and place the block between your two feet. And then you could do, so I got to be, I got my ankles, my heel, my big toe. So there's three places in which I can connect with the block. Outer, inner heel, inner big toe, or ankle bones, inner big toe. Right, so be um, interested in all the choices you can make, whether the heels are staying in contact or the ankles are staying in contact, supinating, pronating, right? So have some consciousness there. And you can have the knees bent and tap without placing, just tap the block to the floor and then take the feet back up and catch the block with your hands. So elbows, knees can bend and like touch block to floor overhead and touch toes to floor uh, below. Put the block now in your feet and repeat. So I'm doing elbows and knees bending, handing the block off between feet and hands. I'm gonna go to straight arms and legs because it's um, more of a challenge for me. Handing the block back to the feet, squeeze the block with the feet, arms overhead. And so handing off, block to feet. I have this vision in my mind that I could lay everybody in a class, in a circle on the floor, or in a spiral on the floor, and have them hand each other, hand to feet, feet to hand blocks, and then piling all the blocks in the middle of the spiral or at the end of the line or something. How much your lumbar moves is a factor. So you don't have to plaster your lumbar to the floor unless, of course, you can't keep it from lifting, right? If you can keep your lumbar from lifting off the floor, then let it be neutral, like let it be responsive. But if it only just arches up when you take your legs away, then you gotta make a different choice. This time, keep the block between the feet. Arms overhead. Bend your knees a lot. Keep a hold on to the block tightly with the feet and the knees are maybe not together, but almost, right? And then if you swing the block to the, swing the feet to the left and then swing the feet to the right. So my knees are right over my hips and this is creating a shortening in the sideways right to left. Can, can we, can you combine, next time you swing the block to the right, try to bring your outer left knee more to the floor. 
So just tweaking that, moving a little bit, and then back to center, and then swing block to the left, and then the outer right leg coming closer. So I'm lowering my knees a little bit as I swing the block to the side. So I'm curious about your ability to roll onto your side without the block touching the floor. So I'm gonna scooch down a little so you can see. I'm probably gonna, here I go. I'm gonna make it so you can see me better now because it's not so detailed about the feet as it was. So here's me rolling onto my side without the block touching the floor and extending the hips. So knees are long from the hips. I'm using my top arm to get around. Pull the knees back up to your chest, roll onto your back, and then start to extend the hips as you roll onto your outer left hip. You can reach your right arm across. Don't let the block touch the floor. Extend your knees, mm -mm. extend your hips. Keep your knees bent. And then you'll flex at the hips and swing the right arm and the block up. And then left arm over, knees to the right, and then extend. And the more you hug the block with the feet, the easier it is to keep the inner legs turned on. When I extend the hips on my side, I try to touch my toe tips to the back of my head. Then as I bring the knees up to the chest, dorsiflex the feet. Keep the feet in dorsiflexion as you swing the knees over to the right. And as you reach your knees away from you, then try to touch your toe tips to the back of your head. One more time, rolling left and right. And you can also start to use your arms less, using your arms less to get you up and over. Let's meet on our right sides, pause. You might uh, have to reach down and reorganize the block. I want it between ankles and feet, ankles and feet on the block. And if you can use your right arm as a pillow, do that. And then straighten your legs long. Let as much of the outer right leg be on the floor as you want. And then with the block between your feet, side lying here, can you supinate both feet? Like you're trying to, I'm gonna adjust my block again. Like you're trying to get the soles of your feet to the flat sides of the block. And your toe tips all curl towards your face. So supinating with dorsiflexion. And I can actually get more of the soles of my feet to the block if I pronate. And then there's a considerably more external rotation. Going back to supinate. One more time. So uh, when I said pronate, I meant to say plantar flex. So I'm keeping the supinating and toggling between plantar and dorsiflexion. Soles the feet trying to stay on the block. Swing and toes towards my nose. And then swing and toes away from my nose. And then use the next toes to nose, neutralize the feet. So inner ankles may be on the block, curl the knees in, roll on your back to your left, extend the hips, and then take your time to extend the knees. And then as much of your left leg on the floor as possible. If you need to adjust the block, grab it, adjust it. And then soles of feet flat to the block. So supinating feet and go between plantar flexion and supination and dorsiflexion and supination. So pointing and flexing with soles of feet flat to block is the short story. Neutralize your feet, squeeze the block, draw the knees up, come on to your back, pause, catch the backs of your knees and rock up. We did this in yesterday's practice. If you release your hands, your hands will do whatever they need to do. Can you throw the block up with your feet and catch it? <laughs> the answer might be no. 
<laughs> I have another clock. So block tossing boat. I love it. I'm not sure why I love it so much. Okay. Release the block tossing boat. Catch your belt again. And um, from your seating, sitting position, um, I'm going to show you my feet again. So once again, my feet touch before my knees do. So I want neutral feet. I want you to find neutral feet with your legs together. Activate your feet with your legs together. And then whatever distance you have between your ankles, put your belt around there. So a nice tight loop, belt loop around your ankles. It's gonna work better if you put the buckle behind you. And with neutral straight legs, the belt is taut. It's tight, but not so tight it's squeezing your legs together. I can still express neutrality through my feet. So for me, it looks like this, right? I still got neutral feet. The belts are just above my ankle bones. Everyone work here, but not so tight that it forces your feet together. At the end, if you come to toe pose, ah, tuck your 10 toes under and have a seat. So what the belt is doing in theory, it's preventing the ankles from accommodating what the feet don't want to do. So be sure as you go in that there's nothing weird pinching or jabby, right? That it feels like a new place to lengthen through. And if you have a longer belt, can you grab the tail of that belt and thread it through your two hands behind you so your hands are shoulder width. And simply try to rip the belt in half, not with all your strength, just enough so you feel some spread across the front chest. Heavy your shoulder blades. Take some nice deep breaths. If you're a happy backbender, check yourself that you're not um, pinching or hardening in the back ribs. Oh boy, okay, so now, Untuck your toes, and I'd like you to have your blanket really close. You untuck your toes and sit on your heels. Can you touch your blanket behind you? If you can, if you can't, reach and grab it. But if you can, I've just got this simple edge of the folded blanket here. I'm gonna fold a few inches of it over twice. So it's not a roll, but it's a fairly thick fold. We're just gonna have that there for a minute on the ready. Catch the belt again behind, shoulder width hands. This time, can you turn the left palm fist so the thumb is forward, thumb is forward, pinky is back, and then keep turning that. So basically you're internally rotating your left arm so your knuckles shine to the space behind you. And if you bend both elbows, I'm gonna turn so you can see. If you bend right elbow, right arms out to the right, you bend left elbow, both forearms are to the right. And then again, try to rip the belt in half. So you're punching right hand to the right and you're pulling left hand to the left, fairly gently, but with determination. And can you hug left shoulder blade into your spine? Heavy shoulder blades, and then now both elbows poke back. Both fists are sort of punching forward and simply swing the elbows, hands the other way. So then left hand is punching left, right hand is trying to pull to the right, but they're in a standoff, and then try to, um, what's the word? Sort of flatten or hug the two shoulder blades against the back ribs, and then right shoulder blade squeezes to spine. 
Right arm is internally rotated, left arm is a little bit externally rotated. Okay, leave that. Tuck your 10 toes under again. Catch the belt um, overhead so that if your elbows are at 90 degrees, the belt is taut. Then straighten the arms. <laughs> And then again, try to rip the belt in half. And then as you do that, can you descend the shoulder blades and start to poke the elbows wide? Find equal spread across back and chest. Shoulder blades heavy, elbows descending, ripping the belt in half. Feel shoulder blades, inner border of shoulder blades coming together. And as you keep bending elbows, dive them a little back and down. Keep squeezing shoulder blades gently towards each other until it feels like the elbows are sort of reaching towards each other and the belt might get a little shaky. And then once you get down there, take a breath. Let it go. Now, if you can place just the toes, just the toes, it's gonna to be mostly big toe, on that little folded blanket. So the big knuckles of the toes are off the blanket. And then have a seat. Uh-huh, so that this creates plantar flexion of the feet in a passive way with the ankles bound so the ankles don't splay out to the side. <clears throat> Let's do that hands overhead belt trick again if you have enough belts. So with the elbows bent at 90 degree angles, the belt is taut to measure and then take your arms up and out. Pull the belt in half, rip it in half, Start to bend the elbows, reach the elbows wide as you squeeze shoulder blades together like a slow-mo latissimus bar pull down and you squeeze the inner borders of the shoulder blades together like you're trying to rip the belt in half. Excellent. And let's do the one we did not too long ago, the one that was a little more confusing. Bring the belt behind you between your two hands, shoulder width. Hold on to the belt, and if you turn the arms so the palms would face each other, I know you got fists, right? And then let the right arm keep turning that way. So internally rotate the right arm and thread that right forearm behind your back. Left arm is pushing to the left, right arm is pulling to the right. It's the same one we did not too many minutes ago. And broaden your collarbones. Go to the other side. So I'm adding a lot of upper body stuff here, and I probably could have said this a while ago. Right arm is punching to the right, left arm's pulling to the left. You could leave all this business out if your feet or in angles are just like, what in the world? You could leave all this stuff out and just deal with your feet, which is what I'm gonna do for this next one. So loosen the belt. Uh, let's untuck the toes. Use your hands on the floor to bring your knees up and maybe flirt with the idea of a squat here if you can. The blanket's there to catch and I'm not putting all my weight into the heels. I'm just taking a little foot break because this last one is a bit of a doozy. If you bring your knees down again. The toes are going up on the blanket again, but this time that knuckle of the toes. So the very distal part of your metatarsal bones which is another way to say the furthest part of your foot bones is on the blanket. The full toes, toe knuckles, all that's on the blanket. Sit down slow, cause wowzer. So the bones of the feet are often overlooked. There's a lot of like toe movement, ankle movement, but your feet, the foot bones have all the same movements, much smaller, one of my mantras that I've learned from one of my beloved teachers, Amy Matthews, is a little bit of movement in a lot of places rather than a lot of movement in one or two places. So if we can get the foot bones in on it, then the ankles and the toes don't have to do so much. The knees and the hips don't have to do so much. OMG, 
All right, last couple of breaths. I'm just gonna shut up and breathe. Notice resistance. So come right to the edge where you don't have to resist. So maybe you're leaning way forward. And if you're resisting, back off. So you can be all in at the level of availability that doesn't require resistance. All right, come forward enough. You can take the belt off. Oops, sorry, that was loud. Push the blanket out of the way with your feet or just sit on your heels and shove it out of the way. Catch your two blocks. Blocks on their second side with a tiny down dog. OMG. <laughs> so short dog with hands on Second side blocks, not their tallest, that's too precarious. Flat side, I use a lot. This is just a little more height in the tiny dog here. Because in the tiny dog, I want you to get the heels down, the big toe mound down, the pinky toe mound down, and then most of the weight's actually in the feet. I'm reaching my tail way back, knees and hips are quite soft. Opening the armpits, sort of holding the blocks down with the hands. And then slowly straightening the legs and bending. Straightening and bending. Straightening and bending real slow. So flexion, ankles, knees, and hips. And then um, extending knees. The hips won't extend here. The ankles won't extend fully. But can you study through the bending and unbending? Can you keep the same relationship in the direction the knees point over the toes? If the knees start to veer in or poke out, can you minimize that? Can you keep a clear line of knees sort of over toes? And then again, the ankles, they're not swiveling or collapsing. So notice the point where that might have to happen, where you might have to change some kind of rotation in the knees and ankles. And is it necessary? If you pause when you meet the resistance, does that eventually provide a thoroughfare and a different pathway? Okay, walk your hands with your blocks a little bit closer. Shorter dog, do a couple more. So now it's almost like hands and knees in terms of my hands are under my shoulders, my feet are under my hips. Let's add a cow when everything bends and you bend your elbows back and look your face forward and reach your tail back and then the cat, like you're trying to touch your forehead and your tail together somewhere under your navel. Let's add on the cat, plant our flexion. So you lift those heels up. Let me lower the heels down. You bend everything, maybe even the elbows. Extend the spine, flex the limbs. And then extend the limbs through the ankles and flex the spine. It might be a little bit like rubbing your tummy and patting your head. <laughs> uh, this is actually a primitive reflex, a grown-up version of it. Spinal flexion with extended limbs and spinal extension with flex limbs. Um, from here, put one block flat on the floor, widthwise across your mat. Put the other block on its tall end. And stepping on the block, the flat block with both your feet, and can you wrap the pinky side of the feet around the block? So I'm going to come closer so you can see. I got my, my hand block out of the way. So, you know, you might call them monkey feet. <laughs> um, supinating, right? With a little bit of, you slide your heels further off the back edge of the block. Supinating with a little bit of 
plantar flexion, and I got the corner of the block right in the arch of my foot, right in kidney one point. And you can sort of catch the corner of the block on the outer foot and then drag the foot across the block. So if you got foam blocks, more bueno. If you got a hard cork block or a wooden block, you got some um, work cut out for you. And so just keep rearranging. I'll slide off and I'll climb up and I'll take my feet higher up. And it's like, can I hang on to the block and start to let the feet sort of slide off? Then I'll play with keeping the big toe mound hooked and curling the toes over and dropping the heel. So just playing around here. And then eventually, eventually um, organizing all 10 toes straight ahead and starting to slide the feet back off the block. And one leg at a time straightens because the other foot needs to keep the block down. <laughs> um, but can you feel into the edge of the block sort of supporting underneath? This is the distal arch, right? So just behind the ball mounds. So the distal transverse arch, you got two transverse arches. You got one closer up to the ankle and one closer to the toes. I teach five arches of the foot, three corners of the foot. Um, that the edge of the block is evenly across the distal arch. So again, the ankle isn't collapsing in or out. Or if you do choose to spin or rotate the ankle, and here I'm doing it with my left foot, and I think you can see. If you choose to let the ankle twist, the knee twist, that it's a choice and you're doing it in the direction that's needed. Oh man, okay. Stand on the floor. Sit on the floor and just like check it out. And however you stand, don't do anything yogic, finger quotes. Like don't put all this contrived overlay of stuff. Just be here with your feet on the floor. It can be a tall order in a yoga class. Holy crap, it's been an hour. <laughs> all right, so let's just do some stand, let's just do some standing poses. Let's do some standing poses. But before I say that, as you're standing, not doing anything yogic, finger quotes, where's your weight in your feet? My habit is to stand forward in my feet, which drops the front of my pelvis, creates a little bit of shortening in the front of my hips, which I feel. So a couple last two Thursdays, no, last two Fridays, both somatic movement classes, I talked about the relationship of the feet to the pelvis. For me, getting more, well, for everyone, getting more weight in the heels is going to pull the back of the pelvis down. Right? So that's medicine for me. You decide. Right foot, left foot, taking more weight is another study. I absolutely load my right leg more. So even just standing here, if I reach my left leg further into the ground like a probe into the earth, I get a whole ricochet rebound response up the rest of my bones. Step or hop your, nope, don't do that. Uh, keep your legs right together and if your feet touch first before your knees, Honor that. If your knees touch first before your feet, honor that. And then can we supinate here? Can you stand on the outer edges of your feet here? Curl your 10 toes towards each other. So like you're standing on a ball. Arms out to the side. Reach evenly through backs of palms, fronts of palms, or backs of hands, fronts of palms, backs of arms, front of arms. And can you feel if the arms are way behind you, front is longer? or if the arms are even a little bit, a little bit in front of you, back is longer. Find that even place, even back and front, which might mean you're gonna feel more sensation in the back or the front. Bend the elbows, you're still supinating your feet, palms face forward, and then bringing hands behind head. Can you interlace your fingers? Bring shoulder blades with you, let them hug more the midline. Stay on the outer edges of your feet now and reach your right elbow up and tug your left elbow down. 
reach through right armpit, reach through right ribs. So go up through the right side, so the whole right side is long, all the way to the outer foot. Switch when you're ready. Reach through the elbow, left elbow now, all the way to outer left foot, outer left heel. And releasing, put your big toe mounds down. Legs are right together, arms right up. Utkatasana. Outer heels heavy and big toe mounds heavy. And the knees, like, they're right in line. You know, you could straighten up and sit back down. And there's not a whole lot of change between the two knees and their distance from each other. Come up again, super slow. Sit down again, super slow. Maybe sit a little lower. And then from here, hands in prayer. And step or hop your feet, not your widest stance, but wider than your hips. <clears throat> and you might have to narrow your stance depending on what you feel. We concluded the somatic movement class last Friday with this move. The feet were a little closer. As much weight as you can get in your outer right heel. Bend that knee. And roll the weight along the outer right foot to the pinky toe mound. So that twists me a little left. I'm going to roll across the toe mounds. Toes five, four, three, two, one. That is how it turns you more. And then push all that weight to your outer left heel. Ride the outer left foot from the heel to the pinky toe. Fifth toe, fourth toe, third toe, second toe, first toe mound and push all the way to the outer right heel. So you end up doing this figure eight and getting as much movement in the joints of the feet, the ankles, the knees, the hips, the pelvic halves, the spine. And then the next time you're on your left foot, pause and externally rotate your right leg so toes are up in the air. Bring the sole of that right foot to the floor and with soft knees, both knees soft now, um, put your weight right in the middle. My stance needs to go longer for side angle, so I bet yours does too. Check out my right foot. Can you inchworm, see how my toes stay curled under the whole time? Can you inchworm that foot further away now? And start to move towards a warrior two. Back leg straightens. Cross your forearms across your chest. Head and tail straight up and down. Right hip purely splaying open. A little external rotation here. Left leg in theory is pure abduction. There's no rotation. Maybe a little bit turned in just to keep the hip socket happy. If you go towards side angle, so with hands on chest, simply lean right shoulder to right knee. Can you feel that left leg turn in? And if you ride the outer right foot more, can you feel the right sit bone scoop under? Come up, keep the knee bent, go down again. And let the right sit bone scoop under and that left hip point wrap down. And come up again, keep the knee bent, and go down again and feel both pelvic halves sort of spiral around. Right hand catches right ankle. Left arm along the side of the body, externally rotate so the palm faces the sky. Reach that arm far, far to the left. Keep reaching as you sweep it up. Keep reaching as you, like a slow-mo basketball dunk, way far overhead. Really reach from left foot to left hand. One or two more breaths. I know it's intense. You're going to swing left arm up, push the right foot down, come on up, turn your ten toes straight ahead, and then heels in, bend the knees, and then toes straight ahead, straighten the legs, lift the heels. Bend the knees, heels in, 
Actually, I think that's only as wide or as narrow as we need to go. So find the width of that stance you had before. Weight in the outer right heel. Wrap it around the outer foot to the big toe, to the outer left heel. Wrap it around the outer foot to all the toes. Pinky to big, big toe pushes you off to the outer right. Pause. Pause in the outer right. Rotate left leg, left toes. Point to sky and then lengthen that foot as you land the toes on the floor. Right knee stays bent. Bend into your left knee. And then inch on the left foot. So like left toes, like claws, like a cat claw, dig them in and pull the left heel to your toes. Then unfurl the toes. And then it's like toes flex, foot flexes. One more might get me long enough to straighten back leg, Vera two legs. The pelvic halves will have to do something to go from vertical spine to lateral spine. So maybe instead of hands here, crossed on chest, you can do hands on hips, hug the elbows back so they're out of the way. As you side bend, this head and tail vector starts to go on the horizon, feel the right hip wrap forward and the left hip scoop under. And swing it back up. Go down again, right hip wraps forward, left hip rolls back and under. Come up again and go down again. And can you tie the right hip wrapping forward more into the big toe of the right foot? Don't lose the outer heel. And can you tie the left sit bone scooping under by riding more the outer foot, not losing your big toe? Right arm long by your side, palm faces up. Reach like mad. Keep reaching as you sweep the arm up like you could touch the ceiling and beyond. And then all the way overhead with that slow-mo basketball dunk. <laughs> Yeehaw. One or two more breaths here. This time, yeah, no. Reach right arm up, push left foot down, come on up. Turn left toes forward. Pause, swing your heels under, bend your two knees a lot. Can you ride more of the outer feet without losing the big toe mound? Notice how that wraps the outer hips under. Straighten your legs, turn the ten toes forward. Can you come up on tiptoes? You have to really press down that inner edge of the ball mound and hug those outer legs in. And then lower your heels, swing them in, bend the knees. Don't do anything that hurts by any means. Outer feet heavier, the big toes rooted, straighten your legs, turn toes straight ahead, get on that inner edge of big toe, pronate, outer feet wrap forward, lift the inner ankle bones, and then lower and turn your heels in. Maybe knees don't bend as much depending on your knees. So it's harder. Outer feet heavy, inner ankles lifted. Let's do one more. Straighten your legs, toes straight ahead. This tiptoe is getting a little bit more in the realm of easier for me anyways. And then down you come. This time, feet are probably about hip width. I'd like you to have your heels maybe a little narrower than hip width and turn your toes out. Um, you might have to adjust this. Stay heavy on the outer feet. I borrowed this one from Shadow Yoga. I love it. So start to squat down. Bring your hands down. Uh, the knees and hips are not going to go that low. Not that low. So what I'd like you to be able to do is bend these enough, bend the knees enough, you could drip the head down, and then maybe with your hands, wrap your arms around your legs. From the front of the shins, hook your elbows around the shins, and then either clasp hands or put the hands on the floor behind you. And then let the head drip down. Ride the outer feet without losing your big toe. Keep reaching the knees wide, but pushing the floor down with your feet and lifting the belly up. If 
From here, take a few more breaths. And then unbend the knees, reorganize the legs to neutral, soften your spine, come rolling on up to neutral. And then from here, kick the heels out a wee bit. So my toes are practically touching each other now. They are touching, big toes are. You might have to negotiate the width here. From the outer hips, if you bring your hands to your outer hips, and bend your knees so the inner front edge, anterior medial thighs come together, and then there's this clear sort of trajectory of flow from outer hips sort of to inner knees to inner heels. In a way, you can sort of, I can sort of rest with not much effort. I'm gonna bring my hands to the hara, low belly. So this is also something they do in shadow yoga. They call it goat stance, I think. Or martial arts people call it goat stance. I get a really clear picture of the difference between my two ankles, which is either a byproduct of or I'm not sure the source of my hip drama. So whatever you feel that doesn't feel quite integrated could be a result of that locale being disorganized itself, or it could be a byproduct of something else, or it could be the source of something else's dysfunction. So staying deeply enmeshed in the synchronicities and the uh, dissonances of how your parts communicate. Okay, re-straighten, re-neutralize. Step to the top of your mat if you're not. Slowly sweep arms up and pause in Urdhva Hastasana. Outer feet to big toe mound, really clear. And draw that up the inner legs from the big toe mound, the arch, the inner ankle, inner thigh, pelvic floor, along the front of your spine to the back of your throat. And look up from your feet. <laughs> look up, reach your face up. Smile. And then swan dive, and as you do, go way forward. Go way forward with your weight. Put a little cat pose in it. Touch the floor if you can. Soften your knees if you need to. You got your blocks. Step, step, plank. Plank. And I'm a big fan of bringing the neck and the head into these belly down poses. Like, put some extension in your neck. Look forward. Like, don't hang your head. Don't keep your neck out of back bends, generally speaking, but right now, please drop your head and look at your feet. <laughs> and then are the inner feet and outer feet the same distance from you? If your inner feet are more forward, if they're all screwed up, if your toes are all twisted around, make it like you're standing. And then bring your gaze forward. If you need to bring your knees down, do that. We're going to go all the way to belly down, all the way to belly down. Keep your hands under your shoulders. Can you reach your big toes back the farthest? So it's like a pronated foot. If you put the pinky toenail on the ground and the big toes the longest, it's pronated. Exhale and feel the belly hollow and the front body soften. Keep that softness. And with the bridge of your nose and your front teeth, reach your face forward and a little up. Shins get heavier, push with your hands as much as your back allows you, and maybe you build an up dog. Feet still pronated. Pronation will lead towards internal rotation. Go back to down dog. Supination will lead towards external rotation. 
Forward bends by nature are primarily external and we have to add internal, generally speaking. Down dog's a forward bend. Step your right foot forward. Uh, yeah, bring your left knee down, but have it so it's a square shape between your two legs. So right shin, left thigh, square, 90 degrees. So not a deep lunge. Left toes tucked under. And your legs, hands behind head, and draw the shoulder blades back and down. So the line from your elbows to the bottom tips of your shoulder blade feels like an even one. There's no pinching in the shoulder joint whatsoever. And then twist to the right, stay upright. Feel some connection if you can find your way from your left knee to your left elbow. If you can find that connection, can you find your way from your left foot to your left elbow? Kind of narrow the hips. And then float that left knee off the ground an inch and twist a little more. Keep the twist, lower the left knee down, around. Okay, so we're gonna do that again. Outer right foot stays heavier with the big toe mound. Back foot, inner left foot reaches back more. Here we go. Twist. And straighten the leg, back leg, and bring the torso to neutral. Party. Still, outer right foot heavier. The inner left foot's reaching back more. Right foot a little soup, left foot a little pro. Nated, hands down. Step back. Go through both dogs if you want them. Neutral feet in plank and chaturanga. Pronated feet in up dog. And in down dog, you might have to add a micro soup. Supination. Left foot forward, right knee drops. Gently as it comes forward. So when you come to stand on that right knee, you've got about uh, one left thigh's length between left foot and right knee. Back toes tucked under. Interlace, other pinky on top if you can work that out. And then tie little plumb bobs on your shoulder blade tips. And as you let the shoulder blades be heavy, keep the elbows broad, and twist to the left. So back foot, right foot, inner foot goes longer, so a little pronating. Left foot, front foot, outer foot's a little heavier, but don't let the knees swing out, keep it abducted. And then float your right knee up an inch, twist more. And then lower the right knee down, pause. Get the hook up if you lost it, right heel to right elbow. Narrow the pelvic floor. Float your right heel up, mm -mm, right knee up an inch. Twist, twist. All at once, straighten back leg. Neutralize torso. Reach up, heart up, face up. Outer left foot heavier, hug left knee into the midline. Inner right foot reaching further, wrap outer right hip forward, down you come with your hands. Step back, choose your dogs, or cat cows, or simply rest. Okay. Come to sit, come to sit. I'm gonna come forward so you can see, and here's where no mat is um, going to be of service. No mat. Um, sitting on your bem with your knees bent, toes out to the side, sort of like if your feet were handlebars on a bike. <laughs> but you're not going to hold your feet. Um, but they're turned out, right? And uh, using your hands behind you to help, upright spine, or catch your shins to help, neutral spine. And if you were to not have your hands either behind you or holding, can you keep a neutral spine? And if the answer is like, no, I spill backwards, then this is your work here. To simply try to lift 
into neutral spine with this um, gentle external rotation of your legs. So the feet are neutral. Use your hands behind you if you need support. Otherwise, work your torso strength via the strength inherent to the torso. So for me, I'm just gonna cross arms or maybe drape hands on opposite shoulders. <clears throat> and if you put your brain in your right foot, can you supinate that right foot? And then what would it take to float that right heel off the floor just an inch? And if you have to really distort your spine, I wouldn't, right? Then land the heel, neutralize right foot, supinate left foot, and then float it off the floor from the supinating foot. Right, when it lands, it goes to neutral, and then right foot supinates and lifts, landing neutral, foot, leg still turned out, supinate left, lift. And then from here, if you keep going, what would it be like to invite the right toes towards your left shoulder? <laughs> the whole, woo, shaky baky, and out it goes, and then left toes, supinated foot towards right shoulder without hyper distorting your spine. It's got to respond a little bit now because the pelvic half, if you really supinate that foot and you're bringing that leg, the pelvic half is coming. So it's creating a little movement in the lower torso for sure. For sure. Wee. Okay. One more time each side. All right, stretch both legs long. Plantar flex pronate. And then what you could do here, if you wish, uh, either with bent knees, a little tabletop, legs right together, or flirt with the idea of legs together and straight and pronating the feet to bring them to the floor. Hips come up, I'm on my hands. My hips are not very high off the floor, but pushing down with the inner edge of that feet, of those feet, and coming into our Purvotasana. So if you're doing it with bent knees, feet on floor, you could certainly put a block between your two knees to help inform the squeezing. And I have to do a, a little dog assist here. Can you go lay down there? I know, you're sliding all over. Go on. Okay. Pardon us. Bye. Go see daddy. Okay. Next move. One foot at a time, pronating and the other foot supinating. So take a peek at the camera. And specifically, the supinating foot's in dorsiflexion and the pronating foot's in plantar. Legs are straight out in front. So if I supinate my left foot and pronate my right foot, it's almost like I'm trying to look at the sole of my foot as if I had gum on the bottom of it. Like, what did I step in? And the right toes are pointing, reaching away. <clears throat> Go back and forth. Alternating one foot soup, one foot pro. And notice the legs are turning. You're sort of rocking into the right side of both sit bones when the right foot's soup and the left foot's pro. And rocking to the left side of both sit bones when the left foot is soup and the right foot's pro. What if we let the external rotation, so let's supinate right, pronate left, this external rotation of the right and invite it to bend the knee like before. And if you keep reaching through your left toes, the feet are separating almost like you're drawing a bow and arrow. And maybe this can roll you into a pigeon pose with no hands. I'm not gonna touch the floor, but my legs got me into pigeon pose. Pause for a second. We're gonna do it again and again, so don't feel cheated because we're going to come out. Stay if you want. But the return is now my right foot's going to start to pronate and my left foot's going to start to supinate. Watch the big toe twang. I almost did it. 
all five toes of the left foot curling towards you, all five toes of the right foot reaching away like bow and arrow, and let that pull you into your pigeon pose by way of the legs. To exit, left foot starts to pronate, right foot starts to supinate. Sound effects are optional. Undo, right foot towards pro, left foot towards soup. Pigeon pose. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna say that's enough of that. And then your choice, could forward bend, could child's pose, could take legs up the wall, could do one more of those purvotanasanas with the pronated feet, big toes the heaviest, whether you do it with bent knees, or straight legs. Something in the middle, something in the middle could just be sitting. And then when you're ready, lay yourself back. If you need support, grab it. If you don't need support, simply drop everything. And check in with the residue, the residue of the practice. There might be an elevated heart rate. Just smile into that. Hello, thank you, beautiful beating heart. There might be some call for deeper breathing. Fall into that lovingly. And as the heart slows down and the breath rate normalizes, feel the response from the rest of the cells of the body, your skin cells, your muscle cells, your bone cells, your blood cells, your nerve cells. Feel all the cells just settle down and they quiet their conversation. As gravity has you more and more, allow it. And simply turn towards this practice of quieting. You know, it's the turning towards something that plants the seeds for connecting. So one of the things that uh, Joseph said last night was our capacity to feel compassion requires us to turn towards difficulty, towards suffering. Right? The maha context of our planetary vibration is just that. But now here in this little microcosm of sweetness and comfort and health, turn towards those truths of sweetness and comfort and health and let that cultivate the seeds of sweetness and care and courage to turn towards things that aren't so sweet. Thank you for tuning in. Please be well. Thank you. I love you. Namaste.